Because adversity is often the breeding ground for development. Dive into neurointerventional stories, the uncensored interviews. Our guests, all leaders in the field of neurointervention, share the difficulties they face, the complications they have had to manage, and speak without filters on little discussed, sometimes controversial, or simply taboo subjects. Hi everyone, my name is Nantia Suji Jantrarat, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Laurent Pierrot. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Pierrot, can you briefly introduce yourself in a few words and your training? So I am professor of radiology in Reims, which is the city of Champagne. I have to accept that, but we are not here to discuss Champagne for <laughs> sure. I was beginning my uh, fellowship in uh, neurology. I started as a neurologist uh, 30, more than 30 years ago. And, you know, at that time, neurology was a very passive uh, discipline, which means that there are not so many treatments to offer to the patients. So in my uh, training for neurology, I was conducted to go in a neuroradiology department. And I, at that moment, I was discovering uh, interventional neurology. And finally, I moved from neurology to interventional neurology, which is, in my mind, a good way to go from clinical approach to a uh, more technical approach and more therapeutic approach. So I was working in uh, La Pitié Salpêtrière, which is a big hospital in Paris so, where neurology is very important. And thereafter, I was trained by uh, Jacques Moret in uh, Fondation Rothschild at the time. And after se several years, I was uh, moving first in a private hospital in uh, Paris and thereafter in Reims to have an academic position. We'll ask the same question for you that we ask everybody in the beginning, which is that what are some of the difficulties professionally that you have encountered in your career? You know, we, we were and we are still uh, meeting some difficulties to have access to some devices, for example. Sometimes you will have to convince your hospital administration that you have some needs and you know sometimes it's difficult to understand but the you know, administration is not understanding what you want mm -hmm. I give you a very simple example now since 2015 and all the randomized controlled trial dedicated to stroke the number of stroke we are treating in my department was going from in 2014 something like less than 10 mm -hmm. maybe 8 or 7 mm -hmm. I don't remember and now we treat 250 patients per year for acute ischemic stroke. Mm -hmm. So, and I was explaining that with just an angio suite, you cannot manage mm -hmm. singularly because certainly that we have to treat patients immediately. We cannot delay the treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to obtain the second angio suite, which is just for the appropriate managing of patients. It was a long battle that I have to conduct. Uh, it, it, it took maybe one year, two years to obtain finally the, ah, uh, yes, you need it. And, uh, so it's something that is, it was a difficulty I had sometimes to convince at the beginning of uh, mechanical therapy with Solitaire. You know, I, I had exactly the same story. You know, I was saying to the administration, we need Solitaire to treat. It was before the randomized control trial, but we were part of TRACE, which is a, a French study uh, dedicated to mechanical thrombectomy. So I was saying, but we need the Solitaire because it's, it's what is now the best option to treat acute ischemic stroke. And, you know, it took me maybe one year to obtain the Solitaire, you know. And sometimes it's difficult to understand because what you, what you are suggesting to your administration is not for yourself, but it's for the well-being of patients, for, for, for the patients to be appropriately treated. So yeah. that's a difficulty we may have. Yeah. Is that something that's unique to where you're practicing or is it uh, the region as a whole? I think it's a country as a world, exactly. You know, so I, I think administration has to rely on us mm -hmm. to make decisions because they have not the knowledge of what is the tools available now at the present time to treat patients. But in the same time, you know, they rely on us, but, you know, they have the impression that we just want to spend money, but we don't want to spend money. We want to spend money if it's necessary. Mm -hmm. If it's not, we don't care. So yeah. I think it's a difficulty we may have, you know. It's probably singularly true 
in the field of INR because you know innovation is going so fast that sometimes you you run after the innovation you know you are you have a new device and a new device is not just something to play it's something to treat patients so but sometimes the, the new device is so innovative you know it's a case for example for solitaire sent require was completely changing the face of uh, acute ischemic stroke treatment and you know but it was coming very soon you know at what at the beginning solitaire was not dedicated to the treatment of stroke by the way but whatever but you know at one moment it was clear that it was working even before the results of the randomized control trial on at least it was clear that it was the best option to treat this kind of patient by endovascular means mm -hmm. so but you know to convince people sometimes it's complicated so yeah. and maybe it's uh, also the reason why you know clinical evaluation is so important for me because i know that if you have a paper demonstrating a result is more easy for you to ask something to say that we need this we need that mm -hmm. but you know sometimes the time you need to demonstrate the benefit is long because you know a clinical study it takes uh, four or five years huh, depending on the on the design of the study the number of patients you include but again it can be a long process so it's something which can be difficult another difficulty we had but i think it's true for everybody is you know we are an emerging uh, sub specialty mm -hmm. so we have to to explain everything, you know, you, we have to explain that we are important. Okay, this uh, the kind of technique we use. We are minimally invasive techniques, you know. They are recognized and uh, in general in the world. I think in France for sure. When you say it's a minimally invasive technique, people understand that there is a benefit. But still, because we are building a new specialty somewhere, you need uh, beds for your patients. But at the beginning, you have no beds because radiologists. Usually, or, uh, because in France it's mostly radiologists who are doing uh, interventional radiology, you know, but radiologists have no bed, for, uh, normal, uh, usually. So, but suddenly you need bed. Ah, why you need beds? But, yeah, but you can place your patient in the neurology department, neuros but it's not exactly the same. And if we want to, to control what we are doing, we need also to have the possibility to hospitalize our patients. So, it's probably because we are an emerging specialty, which is a very poor full specialty in terms of uh, what we can do for patients. We have seen that with acute ischemic stroke treatment, but also with aneurysm treatment. So maybe it help us to, to find our position in the hospital, but we have to accept that it's uh, always a long battle. Yeah. So it sounds to me like the problems are broken up into sort of like a two categories. One category is that the system has not evolve to the point that it adapts as fast as we have to all the new things that are coming out. And so regulatory-wise, hospital administration-wise, they're still kind of slow. We can't change that. But on the other side, which you're working on and, and have extensive resume to show, was that there needs to be better evidence for demonstration of safety and efficacy of new devices. Can you elaborate on that, on some of the work that you have done? You know, I think the beginning of interventional neuroradiology, if we want to make it simple, is ISAT study. You know, ISAT <laughs> study was the first We're study dedicated. Yeah. No, no, but, you know, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. to make a long story short, it was yeah. the first study and it was establishing the endovascular treatment as the first light treatment when you can do both options, which are endovascular treatment with coiling or clipping. So I think it was really important. But, you know, after ISAT, when you look at that, okay, we have uh, several years, but when I say several years, maybe 10, 15 years, without too many innovation, I have to accept that, but also without too many clinical evaluation. You know, everybody was publishing his own series of uh, coils. <laughs> I remember Val d'Isère meeting where we had, uh, you know, a, a full afternoon of uh, t 10 people presenting their own series. But what, what it was giving us? Nothing. So, because I think, you know, if we want to support the new tools that we have to treat patients, we need to evaluate them. And when I say we need to evaluate them, it's, it means that we have to determine the safety and the efficacy of the device. For example, for aneurysm treatment, the safety is what is the rate of intraoperatory rupture, what is the rate of thromboembolic complication, in terms of efficacy, what is the rate of recanalization, the long-term follow-up, etc. But, but for that, we need 
to build multi-centers, prospective, independently analyzed uh, studies, which are not necessarily a randomized controlled trial, depending on the goal of the study. But you need to have this kind of information. It's very important. So that's really what we need uh, in the field of acute ischemic stroke, in the field of aneurysm treatment, in, in the field of brain EVM. So we know that, uh, you know, sometimes study will dramatically change our practice. You know, for example, you know, Aruba study, uh, we can discuss Aruba study because the design was probably not very well uh, adapted to evaluate the story, the endovascular treatment, as a treatment in general of unruptured brain AVMs. But, you know, it, it was completely changing our practice because before Aruba, we were treating a lot of brain AVMs, including unruptured ones. And now we treat more or less only ruptured uh, brain AVMs or brain AVMs with anatomical risk factors. So just to show that, yes, when we analyze properly things, it can change dramatically the clinical practice on the clinical issue for the patient. So it's very important. So, and I think at the beginning, you know, in our field, it, because it was a small uh, field, by the way, with a limited number of physicians, etc., etc. So we were trying to develop the technique, but I think at one moment, and I, it was more or less the beginning of my career, there was a, a lack of proper evaluation. So mm -hmm. it is changing. It, I think it's changing probably partially due to the important evaluation we need in the field of acute ischemic stroke, but not exclusively. You know, when I discuss now with companies, they all understand that they cannot just come and say, my device is good, my device is safe, my device is efficacious, but we are the proof. We have 10 patients who were treated, it was very well. No, you cannot do that. You know, we need to have a proper evaluation of the, of the things uh, in the field of acute ischemic stroke, in the field of aneurysm treatment, and in other fields. You know, so that's so very important. Yeah. I know you also have extensive portfolio in your work for hemorrhagic stroke, the aneurysm side of things. Can you name some of the difficulties that you have encountered, especially now in this era where everything is all about acute ischemic strokes? A lot of money going into it, very fast changing field. What do you see is in the horizon for the hemorrhagic side of yeah, things? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point, what you say, because effectively you know the number of patients with acute ischemic stroke is higher compared to the number of patients with aneurysm mm -hmm. not with aneurysm but with ruptured aneurysm which is uh, the acute ischemic stroke but which is a stroke with the subarachnoid bleeding mm -hmm. so i agree that it was a risk but i think it was finally it was a risk at the beginning to have Everybody focused, when I say everybody, physicians, company, uh, health authorities focused on acute ischemic stroke. But you know, in the same time, subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysm pathology is a frequent one. In fact, in the analysis, more recent analysis, the percentage of the population with fracanal aneurysm is 2 to 3 percent. So it's not nothing. So we have to manage this. It's an important topic, singularly because it's a severe disease when you have a rupture. So it, it's important. And I don't see since 2015 or even before, I don't see that the, the fact that we have to invest a lot of tools in in terms of uh, financial support, in terms of uh, personal investment, etc., etc., in the field of acute ischemic stroke, I don't see any decrease in our interest and in our investment for evaluating hemorrhagic stroke, which is still something very important. And also because I think there is another reason I have to accept that we have to accept that, which is there is a great interest in the field for aneurysm pathology because it's uh, maybe a little bit more complex pathology. And, you know, also we have a lot of tools. So it gave us the opportunity to select tools, to discuss what is the best tool. So, you know, it's a little bit different because we start earlier the treatment of hemorrhagic stroke. So we have more tools, but we have more tools that need to be evaluated on not only the tools, but the more appropriate approach for every patient, which is not exactly the same from one to another. It can be that one patient will benefit from coiling. It can be that a patient will benefit from flow diverter. It's exactly the topics that were discussed during the link this year. When to use a flow diverter, when to use a web, when to use coils, etc., etc. So I think hemorrhagic pathologies are still very important. It's an 
important part of the evaluation we have to conduct, that's for sure. What do you see in the horizon for the hemorrhagic field as far as tools? What do you think we will see more of in the future? You know, maybe it's difficult to answer because, you know, aneurysm, you have small aneurysm, large yeah. and giant aneurysm, so maybe it's a little bit different. But, but to make a short answer, I think at, for 20 years, we were more or less working with one tool, which was coils. Mm -hmm. But coils has a big limitation, and we published that in the ARETA study, which was conducted in France, showing that the rate of recanalization after one year, okay, recanalization was very precisely defined as any change mm -hmm. in the intracircular circulation. But, you know, the rate of recanalization was still close from 30%. So it means that we need other tools. Mm -hmm. On these other tools, some of them, we have them, which are flow diverter, which are intracircular devices. So my opinion, but I think I am not the only one to share this opinion, is that we will have a progressive decrease of aneurysm coiling mm -hmm. and we will have an increase of the use of intracircular flow disruptor or intracircular devices, an increase in the use of uh, flow diverter. By the way, the technique which has the best results in terms of anatomical results in the long term is clearly flow diversion. So one limitation we had with flow diversion was the need of dual antiplatelet treatment, which precludes us to use this technique for ruptured aneurysm. But now we will have the surface modified flow diverters. So it will maybe change the face of the situation because maybe we will be able to use flow diverter with a single antiplatelet treatment, which will potentially give us the opportunity to use flow diverter also in ruptured aneurysm. So to me, the global evolution will be decrease of the use of coiling or increase in the use of the new tools, which are, they are not completely new huh, because flow diversion, we have it since 2007 or 2008, but it's still relatively new. We will, we will have an increase in the use of these tools, that for sure, because they give better results compared to standard coiling. But again, I think we can say that, but we need proper evaluation. For example, for surface modified flow diverter, we have no other option than to conduct a randomized control trial because if you want to know if surface modified flow diverter with single antiplatelet therapy do at least as, as good as a bare flow diverter with dual antiplatelet treatment, mm -hmm. how to compare yeah. You need uh, to do a randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. Same for, uh, you know, intrasacular devices. At one moment, we will need to have a, a direct comparison between intrasacular devices mm -hmm. and coiling. So I think it's this clinical evaluation is very important for us to have appropriate recommendation regarding what is the best tool to use to treat this kind of aneurysm because probably you have some indication for flow diverter which are not exactly the same for flow disruptor or for a web or for coiling, you know, because there will be certainly a residual indication for coiling in the, in the future. Yeah. Flow diverters is such um, an elegant treatment, and I'm not going to claim credit on this, but someone once told me, and it, the light bulb went off in my head, which is that any new technology should make the field easier for anybody to do it, meaning you don't have to have high level of skill in order to start. And so any treatment that doesn't require you to enter the aneurysm is just such an elegant evolution yeah. of technology. It democratizes the field. That's a very good point. And, you know, it's a discussion I had several times with several people in the field. And, you know, at the beginning, I was not so convinced of that. Yeah. I will tell you because, you know, when I was starting, you know, it was a small uh, field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you are own technical skills were very important. So easy to use was not yeah. so important. But, yeah. you know, now that the field is growing singularly due to mechanical thrombectomy, mm -hmm. so the number of physicians will grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree that easy to use is very important. But mm -hmm. what you mentioned is exactly that. The web is exactly what wide neck bifurcation aneurysm, mm -hmm. to be uh, very simple, but before web, when I was seeing a wide neck MC aneurysm, when I was going in the hundred swing, I was thinking, okay, I, how I will manage today? Because <laughs> now, yeah, no, exactly. And you you Complex had already sensing. some options, but which were relatively complicated. Yes, when, yes. you know, I see the web for the first time in 2010, you know, I was saying, ah, oh, 
yes, maybe it's a, it, maybe it's a solution which will make the treatment more simple, safer, and maybe more efficacious. So you know, it it was uh, I, I was. I was not convinced since the beginning, and I was conducting uh, all the European studies at the beginning uh, dedicated to web. But seeing the device, I was thinking, yes, maybe it's something which will be very interesting. But again, the clinical evaluation was needed. And by the way, web is considered in the field as one of the devices which has the best evaluation. Huh? So, because you know, evaluation started more or less with the clinical use, and it's a way to do it. You know, because. In the same time, you cannot just say, yes, I treat uh, 40 patients in my center, and it goes well, but it goes well. And what, what I, uh, do I remember my 40 patients? No. Mm-hmm. So we need precise data. And the fact that we had precise data we, uh, was helping the development of the technique. Yeah? So I think it's really very important. Yeah. Very good point. I asked this question to some of the interviewers as well, but I'm interested to hear your opinion on this. As someone who is experienced with the new upcoming devices, how do you balance the potential benefits with the associated risk and uncertainties that come with them? Yeah, that's also a very interesting point. I think when we have a new technology, from the beginning, we have to evaluate it in clinical studies. And by the way, now by regulation, in, uh, for some devices in France, we cannot use them if they are not in a clinical study. But you have the device. You start with a new device. So by definition, you don't know the performance of the device. Is it good? Is it safe? Is it efficacious? Well, you don't know. So why not starting from the beginning, the clinical evaluation with a proper design of the study? It, maybe it's a registry, a multi-center collection of data. Maybe it's a randomized control trial. You need, again, to evaluate it because we say that we have a lot of uh, clinical development, flow diversion, intrasacular uh, devices, blah, 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 blah. But what we can say also, that we have a lot of devices arriving on the market, and finally, after two or three years, they disappear completely because yeah. the performance is not here, yeah. safety is not present, or efficacy is not sufficient. Mm-hmm. So if we want to accept or refuse a new device, it has to be properly evaluated. I know that I repeat a little bit the same thing, but to me, it's so important. You know, clinical evaluation, to me, it's part of my clinical practice. We have a little bit of um, a survival bias in the way we talk about the new technologies and devices that arrive in the field because we only talk about the ones that survive. Just like what you said, if we actually pile them together, the ones that did not survive, yeah, I think it, it would make a very convincing point on the need to evaluate it more systematically because no. it will be the list would be a mile long exactly right? you see we even in the field of aneurysm treatment mm-hmm. we have seen some devices that were available uh, several years ago mm-hmm. at the beginning okay they, they were used in a limited number of centers thereafter there were the clinical evaluation sometimes with a limited number of patients the device finally has not the performance that we were waiting for the device disappear because yeah. it's not working you know so uh, yeah. I, I we don't talk about it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and we, don't, exactly. we don't talk about it at these yeah. meetings. So. Yeah. Since we're nearing the end, I'm going to go into the four questions that we ask every interviewer. And the first question is that if you can take a journey through time 10, 15 years ago, what would you do differently in your career or what do you think we should have done differently in our field? One first thing I will have to do better is I will have push for more evaluation Mm -hmm. but I have to accept that the problem is that it was not in the spirit of the time at at that moment Mm -hmm. so maybe something uh, which was on the second thing it's a little bit what we were saying at the beginning is that you know I think from the beginning we have to consider that we are a full specialty dedicated to the treatment of specific disease i was involved in the question of training of ANR physicians mm-hmm. at the european level and you know we try to establish criteria on the, the way to be properly trained see what we were discussing is that we don't care where the people are coming from, if they are radiologists, if they are a neurosurgeon, if they are neurologists. As soon as they have the proper training, 
It's okay for them to do an interventional radiology. I, I have no problem. A number of colleagues now in the US, they are probably more numerous than uh, radiologists. So, but it's not the problem. I think the proper training, but you know, it was a, again to push the training, to explain that we need the proper training. It was uh, also something very important. We were writing some recommendations at, at the European level, but to make them accepted, It was relatively complicated because, you know, people were thinking, okay, uh, as somebody say in the audience room today, you can be trained for mechanical thrombectomy in two weeks. No, you cannot be trained for mechanical thrombectomy in two weeks because before placing the stent of the aspiration catheter in the m segment, you have to just puncture the femoral artery or the radial artery as you want. You have just to enter the internal carotid artery, which is not always an easy task, etc., etc. So, no... You cannot be trained in two weeks, for me, even for mechanical training to me. Yeah. The second question is that if we fast forward 15 to 20 years, what do you think the field would look like at that time? Well, it will be completely different. Yeah. In 10 and 20 years, I will n- no longer be part of the activity probably, but you know, we know that because we already see that partially. We will have robot. Vitor was presenting last year in that link, you know, the use of a robot to treat necomanorism. Mm-hmm. Honestly, before he was showing me that, I was a little bit reluctant and I was saying, okay, but he, a robot will never do as good as my fingers. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I was impressed. Yeah. Second thing which will certainly change also the practice, which is IA, that's mm-hmm. for sure. I, I think somebody in the field would try to conduct a study to analyze the factors that in front of a re- unruptured aneurysm can predict the future rupture of aneurysm. So IA will maybe help us, you know, to select the patient who has to be treated for unruptured aneurysm because as of now we have a limited number of analyzing factors, size of the aneurysm, uh, regular or not, blah, 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 but it's very limited, the number of age of the patient indeed. You know, I think it will completely change. And also maybe the tools we use to control our procedure. As of now, we use X-ray. Ten years ago, maybe more, maybe 15 years ago, somebody was saying, oh, in 10 years, we will just do interventional radiology under MRI control. But it's much more complicated yeah. than it seems to be. Yeah. But, you know, maybe it will change also, you know. What is interesting, again, is that when you look at the evolution of interventional radiology, you have a parallel evolution of the device we have to treat patients on the technology we have to control the treatment we do. You know, for example, okay, more or less we do all the treatment in the angio suite as of now. And it, but you know, at the beginning we had two D angio, and at one moment we were realizing that to place properly coils, we have to understand where is the neck. Mm-hmm. So, it leads to three D angio development. Mm-hmm. Thereafter, we have to evaluate properly the position of the device mm-hmm. according to the aneurysm wall, the arterial wall. So. Mm-hmm development of vasocity or uh, dynacity. So, you see, it goes a little bit in parallel. You have a new technology for aneurysm treatment. You have a new technology to control. I, I think what we miss, we miss some information regarding physiology, which means, for example, aneurysm flow analysis. You know, it's a topic which is discussed since I started (laughs) in the interventional radiology, we discuss this topic. So it means that it's not an easy one. But but it's maybe important to understand the flow to properly treat an aneurysm. So all these tools will help us, that for sure. I am sure that the practice will be completely different in 10 years and in 20 years. So if we now turn our attention to the training of future interventionists coming out, What are we not doing enough for them, in your opinion? I think where something is missing sometimes, singularly for those who are coming from radiology, is there is something we have not to forget. We are dealing with patients. Mm -hmm. So which means that we need to be able to precisely evaluate the clinical situation and to manage the clinical situation. And I, I have to say, I think it's an important part of the training 
you know, you need to know what is the result. But the result is not only, yes, I was able to place the coils, the stands, the web, whatever you place. The goal is to know how is the patient. So it's very important. I think another part which is very important is anatomical training because, you know, anatomy is very important. I give you a very simple example. We always say external carotid embolization is simple. And the place of this technique is increasing with uh, the treatment of subdural hematoma. But it's, it's not simple to embolize external carotid artery. You have to know precisely anatomosis are at risk. But for that, you, you need to know anatomy. That's very simple. So, again, I think this is very important. Something which is probably missing also, but you will be maybe surprised, but maybe not. Huh? We need to have a, a training in psychology for them to be able to, you know, to manage the relationship with the patient. I think it's very important. I say that because I don't have this kind of training, to be honest. <laughs> and I see that... When I consider my consultation 20 years ago and now, you know, there is a tremendous improvement. I think maybe my skills, technical skills also improve. But honestly, I know that I do very better consultation now than 20 years ago. But it's because we are not prepared, you know, to this interaction with different people. You know, one consultation with one patient is not the same as uh, another one. Huh? It's completely different because people have not the same level of knowledge, have not the same level of knowledge understanding so you have to adapt what you say to the patient according to the to what they feel to what they think to what they know etc etc to, to me the true training in terms of uh, clinical practice in the under suite is not to know how to place a coil because everybody can do that but you know what is important is to be able to properly manage complication uh, to me it's the uh, most important part of the training on a cl technical point of view couldn't agree more We've discussed several difficult topics, so we're going to end on a more positive note, which is in the past months or years, what do you think has been the highlight of our field? I think technological advancements was the most important thing. When I say that, it's considering devices and also the system we use, but I think, you know, we, we are in a period where we really have uh, innovation mm -hmm. and I think it's changing the face of our practice. Uh, now with the web, uh, you know, we treat maybe some aneurysm which were not treatable by endovascular means. Mm -hmm. Same thing with flow diverters. So I think we are really in a period of time where we have important technical developments mm -hmm. which effectively change our practice. Well, Dr. Pierrot, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you very much.